Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Real Estate Success Podcast. I'm your host today, Jim Ingersoll, and it's a beautiful snowy morning in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And uh, so we are sort of trapped in. And uh, because of that, we've got some amazing content for you today on transitioning into bigger deals, development, um, commercial. We're going to talk about new construction, how to go from single family homes to, to bigger projects and still do all of that and create cash flow and the equity that you're looking for. By the way, if you're not signed up for our boot camp yet, you need to do it soon because we're going to sell out before long here. Go to investortrainingsummit.com and join me in person in January in Richmond. We would love to have you along and work with you on creating a great 2019. So our special guest today is Greg Dickerson, who I've known for quite a while now, Greg, right? <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, going back probably since 2003 or four, uh, you know, back time. when you first started, right? Yeah, and you were in the Outer Banks at that point. That's right. That's right. And I found you through cheap Richmond homes when you were first wholesaling and you were doing bus tours <laughs> and, uh, and uh, really, I mean, you were, you were really the only guy doing it on a scale in Richmond and uh, you were kind of the go-to guy back then for wholesale deals. And it was a lot of work, but yeah, we wholesaled 120 houses in one year and that's, that's a lot of deals and a lot of transactions. But yeah, you're right. That it was cheap Richmond homes and I built a massive buyer's list of over 3000 people and, you and I got to, to know each other way back then. So let's let's go back in time a little bit. All right, so that was like 2003 or four or five or whatever. What did you do like at the turn of the century? That sounds funny to say, but you know, go back a little ways, like before you were doing all this development and construction and all this stuff, what did you used to do? So, you know, my background, um, I went in the Navy right out of high school. So I oh, wow. didn't go to college, I just, uh, I went straight in the military in the Navy right out of high school. When I got out of the Navy, I did two things. I worked in restaurants and construction, and I was working in a restaurant. And there was a guy doing an addition on the restaurant building uh, that I was working in, and he asked me you know, if I wanted to make some extra cash and come clean up after him um, <laughs> during the day. So I did, and that's how I got started in construction. I kind of enjoyed being around it and doing it, and I started working with him on other projects and learning. And then I started doing my own you know, little side projects, fences, decks, things like that. Uh, while I was working in restaurants. And in 1997, uh, we moved to the Outer Banks of North Carolina from Virginia Beach, which is where I'm from. And I decided to start a remodeling company. And uh, it was just me, my, uh, myself, my truck tools, doing anything and everything, little $250 handyman jobs, uh, little deck jobs, trimming houses for builders. And uh, seven years later, we were one of the largest builders and developers there. We were doing about 30 million a year. And uh, that was 0405, about the time you and I met. And uh, I sold that company. That's when our market, and I think most markets peaked the first time before the crash. Yep. Uh, I kind of saw that coming, uh, sold everything I had, and just kind of took a step back and started doing more of the development model where uh, I focused on finding the deals, creating opportunity, and then I would hire other builders to work for me and started outsourcing more at that point. So that's kind of my short story. And you know, that, that's amazing because those houses in the Outer Banks are beautiful. So you got to work on the beach. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's a whole different ball game. Much easier from a construction standpoint. You know, site work takes a couple of days instead of a month or two. Uh, everything's sand. Uh, and I've got a Facebook page, Greg Dickerson, where I've got some videos of putting pilings in on some houses that we just recently built down there. I still do some spec houses down there. And uh, we built some big houses. We built uh, three of the largest houses ever built in Nags Head, and they still are the largest houses built in Nags Head wow. back during the boom. We did a 10,000 square foot, 16 bedroom house that, Holy believe man. it or not, that house does 350,000 a year in rental income. So it's kind of like a small multifamily property. Uh, you get to keep about 65% of that gross income to contribute towards debt service, or if you pay cash, right. you know, that's gonna be your cap rate calculation off that, that net income. Uh, so these things are pretty good. The, the big <laughs> houses down there, uh, are kind of like uh, multifamily properties. You can do an eight bedroom, nine bedroom motion front house that, you know, that thing will do about 250,000 a year in uh, gross rental income. And you can, you can build that for about 1.8 to $2 million. So that's a really good cap rate uh, and gross rental multiplier. How much of that's eaten up in property management fees and things like that? Though? So on the bigger houses, typically anywhere from 10 to 20%, depending on, you know, where it's at, who the property management company is, you can average about 15. And then with insurance, insurance is a big deal. You know, that's going to be about a 5% factor. You got pool maintenance, uh, general 
general housekeeping maintenance, things like that. So like I said, at the end of the day, you got to factor about 30, 35% uh, operating costs and that's all in. That's everything but your debt service, right? Uh, which is very comparable to multifamily. Smaller multifamilies, you can get down to that 30 to 40% uh, operating costs. The bigger property is going to be 50, 55%, you know, uh, depending on the, on the size of it and the type of building. Uh, so it's very comparable to a multifamily deal. So you're building really large beach houses. And my first takeaway is I thought it would be difficult to build on the beach. No, no, it's it, it really back. <laughs> Just go back through then. the sand until you hit rock. I mean, what do you, how do you do that? Yeah. Parts? So you, uh, you know, you have a bobcat with an auger bit and uh, you drill down about six feet. That's about as far as you can get before the hole starts imploding on itself. Then you set the pilings in the hole and you have a high pressure water tank and uh, you have about a four to six inch pipe and you literally wash the sand out from underneath the piling. And uh, if you can imagine, I've got a Coke bottle here, yeah. you know, the piling just kind of sinks as it gets washed down and the suction of the sand, you're an engineer. So the suction of the sand just, just, you know, holds it tight. And then when you're done, you come in and you just tamp it that last, you know, six to eight inches. Um, and it's, it's rock solid. It's kind of similar to putting in a bridge piling, you know, how they tamp yeah. bridge pilings, yep. except they wash them down first. So, you know, like I said, you can see the whole process on my Facebook page. Everybody's fascinated with, you know, that process. How does, how does the piling situation work? And, you know, from there, then you have to, uh, you have to top the pilings after they're tamped, uh, which means you got to cut them off. So you got to set your benchmark where your girder is going to go in, which would be the house band on the foundation of a typical right. house. So you go around, you build a little scaffolding around the outside of the pilings, uh, mark everything, you cut the top of the piling, then you cut what's called your seat cut, which is about half of that piling that you notched to put your girders in. And then once you do that, it's a floor system on up, just like any other house. Uh, the only difference is we build to wind codes of 150 mile an hour down there. So everything is tied from the foundation up. So you got to strap bolt, uh, everything, your sheathing has to overlap. So it's just a different set of code parameters. Whereas up here, some, in, some of your areas we build for more of a snow load. Um, we've got a small factor of that down there, but it's mostly uplift and wind. Yeah. I always wondered like when a hurricane comes in, how do they keep those houses literally from just like pulling out? And, so and that's really it. So, in the tie down. Yeah. So if you look at what happened in Florida, you know, Hollywood Beach and, you know, that area down there, uh, I guess, what was it? Uh, I can't remember the beaches that just got leveled in Florida with the recent hurricane, you know, last season. You'll see there was one or two houses that were standing. Everything else got leveled. And those houses were the ones that were built on pilings because once you have those pilings in the ground, you're not pulling them out. And, you know, what happens is, if anything, the ground floor, you know, might get compromised and the water will just flow through it. So Isabel was the worst hurricane I went through in the Outer Banks. I was there from 97 till 2011. I had a, I had a big tree drop on my house in Isabel. Yeah. I that, remember it very well. That was a bad one. So I had eight oceanfront houses under construction in different phases during Isabel. And mm -hmm. I mean, we had some direct ocean impact down on Hatteras Island. And all it did was just, you know, knock the doors out, fill the ground floor up with sand and uh, cover the pools. So we just had to dig everything out. It, it really wasn't a big deal. I mean, it did not level you know, the houses like it did in Florida. And a lot of those houses were just built on slabs that basically had little anchor bolts tying them down to the foundation. So that's really not going to give you a lot of protection. You know, when you, when you drive those pilings in the ground and when you're on the ocean, they have to go 16 feet deep. So that, that's rooted. I mean, that's rooted into the ground. And then everything ties from that point up so that it cannot be pulled out of the ground or leveled. You know, the worst you're going to do is lose some shingles. You know, if the windows get compromised, uh, you know, you'll have some interior damage, but We've seen some pretty rough hurricanes down there, and, and the newer construction has survived well, and even the older houses. But we've never had a direct hit from a major hurricane uh, of 140, 150 mile an hour forces. They've always been the 120, 130 range. And I don't know, for whatever reason, they seem to fizzle out right before they hit you know, the Outer Banks. I think the water's too cold off the coast and just kind of sucks the fire out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. That's really cool. So you're building these really big houses. You're building beach houses. Fun to work on the beach. And you sort of timed it really well. And then you sold your construction company. Do you look back and say, were you a little bit lucky or were you really smart? I mean, you did it at just like the right time, I think. Yeah, I think it was, you know, just luck, right place at the right time. And then I had a, I had a, um, a partner who taught me the business of spec building. So I didn't know anything about real estate. I'd bought my first house, you know, uh, when I got married in 1990 and um, never really thought about real estate as a business or a career. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd read a couple of books. Russ Whitney was out there at the time. Carlton Sheath was out there. 
so when I moved to the Outer Banks, um, you know, we bought a house down there and I started doing remodeling and I was remodeling some houses for a couple of guys that were doing big beach houses. They would take these beach houses in a, in a high end area that didn't have a ground floor or a pool. And that's when pools started becoming really popular. Uh, every house has a pool now. Back then they didn't. So mm. these guys were taking these houses, putting elevators, pools, closing in the ground floor and doing rec rooms. And it would cost them about a hundred to 150,000. And it would add twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year in rental income. So that was a pretty good little ROI, and it would add that exponential value to the house as well. So if they bought the house for a million, put you know one hundred fifty thousand in it, now it was worth one point five, you know, because of rental income. So these guys were were doing this, and I was watching them. And then I had another friend of mine who was a realtor, and uh, he came to me and said, "Hey, I, I know where we can buy this lot for I don't know. I'm just going to use some round numbers. I know we made thirty grand on the deal, but I can't hear how much the lot was. So let's say we bought it for a hundred. And he, he, he knew we could resell it like the next week for 150. So that was my first flip right mm -hmm. out of the gates. We went in there, I bought the lot, put up the money. He did everything else and we split the profit. Uh, we made about $15,000 each. And I was like, you did hey, a joint venture, like a exactly. partnership. Exactly. I was like, this, this is awesome. I was like, I didn't even know you could do it. I was kind of like, is this legal? <laughs> Can you Easy, buy a right? lot today like and printing sell money. it for twice as much the next week? You know, I didn't even know you could do that. And, uh, you know, so that was my first deal. And uh, so I got a little taste of real estate investing and I had a building company I was building at the time. So I was kind of focused on that. And, um, you know, then I uh, partnered up with a, a friend of mine who was a developer out of Northern Virginia and he was doing land development deals and subdivisions and things like that, much more sophisticated than me. And uh, he came in and uh, we started partnering on spec houses. So I built my first few spec houses with him and uh you know these big beach houses and we would build them put them in the rental program and sell them a year later when they'd be worth you know a little bit more money so that's kind of how i evolved so part luck right place at the right time moving to the outer banks pre-boom because right. it was easy i mean it was easy literally you could buy something or build something and the next you know six months to a year later it was worth almost twice as much as you paid for it so uh it was easy credit anybody could get a loan as a builder I was able to go take these lots down and I'd do one of two things. I'd either build it for myself and, uh, and then I would turn around and flip the house, you know, six months to a year later when it was done, or I'd flip the lot to an investor. I'd make a spread on the lot, usually 25 to 30,000. And then I would build them a house. So I'd make a fee on the construction, but they owned it. So those were my two business models at the time. And I was using traditional bank financing. So, you know, I could only do so many deals myself. Uh, so anything else that I couldn't do, uh, I only had like a $10 million line of credit at the time. So when I maxed that out, then I would flip lots to my investors and I would do deals for them. And as I'd sell a house, I'd do another one. So, uh, you know, I was doing 20, 15 to 20 of them a year, you know, for that, for that two year real big boom cycle. Uh, so it was a really interesting time you know, to be on the Outer Banks. And that's kind of how I grew up in, in the real estate world. Never really did a whole lot of traditional flips or anything like that because it just wasn't the model down there. Uh, but I did do some commercial projects and some land development deals and I'd buy oceanfront hotels, tear them down, um, build houses on those. So I, I did a few things like that. And I did a couple of commercial wholesale flips where I just flipped the land on the hotel and then built the houses for, for an investor. Um, I had one deal that brought in, uh, my first one brought in $80,000 on basically a wholesale assignment. I didn't even close. I signed my contract for 80 grand for this three lot oceanfront development where I built those three 12 bedroom uh, oceanfront houses in Nags Head. Those were the first three largest houses ever built, and they they still are. Uh, and then after that, I did that 16 bedroom. But the last hotel I did, deal that I did down there, um, I had a contract uh, with somebody. We were doing a joint venture. He owned the land, and mm -hmm. it was a hotel that was destroyed by Isabel, and uh, he wanted to redevelop it. And you know, Isabel was uh, I don't remember what year that was. What 2000? Probably two or three, four, something yeah, like somewhere that. Somewhere in there. <laughs> uh, He'd come to me and said, hey, you know, what can we do with this property? I said, well, we need to tear it down and build houses. That's all you can do. It was a small property. I said, with your CAMA regulations, Coastal Area Management Association, you're not going to be able to do anything else but single family homes. And he wanted to do condos. And he had somebody telling him you could do condos. And I said, you're not going to be able to do it. So we spent two years, about $250,000 trying to do condos. And they actually, they got shut down by the county uh, and by FEMA. Um, because, you know, the property just didn't have enough depth, you know, with setbacks mm -hmm. and things. So he came back to me, uh, walked in my office just out of the blue uh, three or four years later. So that would have been 2000, probably six or seven and says, hey, I'm ready to do this deal now. So huh. we get together, we do a contract where, you know, he owns the land. I'm going to bring the money to build the houses and we're going to build them, sell them, pay off his uh, note that he had remaining in the land and split the profits. 
Well, along the way, a friend of mine, you know, the market started changing. So yeah, this was 06, 07, yep. probably 07, 08. So uh, when, by the time we had gotten to this, right. And we started, you know, things started changing. And it was just before, I guess it was the fall of 2008, just before 2009, I said, look, things are changing. Why don't we just sell the oceanfront land? And we had a piece across the street, semi-oceanfront, and then we'll develop that and we'll be free and clear on that. And we can, you know, pocket this and it'll give us construction funds. He said, okay. So again, all I have at this point is a joint venture agreement. No money out at all. So I tore down the hotel, um, you know, cleaned the lots up, stabilized them, got them ready to build, put together a little feasibility on what could be done with them and flipped all the lots to a um, very sophisticated developer out of Norfolk um, who bought all four of them. And I made uh, $351,000 on that wow. deal just from that one flip. And then we still had the semi oceanfront piece uh, to develop. And then we ended up just flipping that and I made another 125,000 on that. Again, not a dime out of my pocket, just a complete. That's uh, pretty nice. It's like printing money. You're like the federal reserve. Exactly. It was, it was, you know, and <laughs> that's the other bank. checks. Right. And that's how it was on the outer banks. You know, it was just, it was just really easy at the time to do those things because properties were escalating. So um, on a couple of the deals where I had another hotel, I tore down and, and built some oceanfront houses, the way it was working as a builder, I had equity built in. So I could go to the bank and my cost to do an eight bedroom oceanfront house at the time was probably 1.2, 1.3 million land and house. And I'd pay 600,000 for the land and I'd build $800,000 or $700,000 worth of house, whatever it was. Um, I'd have to go back and look at it, but it would appraise at 1.8, 1.9 million. So I would be able to get those deals done without having to put any money down because the equity was there because they were lending on loan to value back then, not loan to cost or, or, you know, whichever was greater. So, you know, nowadays they'll, they'll lend on loan to value or loan to cost, whichever is less because they want you to have some skin in the game. They do. And, uh, and you got to put that down payment down back then we didn't have to do that. And, uh, you know, so. I was actually getting paid as a builder to build those houses. And at the end of the day, I'd own them and I'd have three, $400,000 worth of equity in them. Mm. And then came 2009, right? So uh, I had about six or eight of those uh, in 2009 that uh, mm. I had, I don't know, probably eight, $10 million worth of equity in. And overnight it evaporated. You know, you couldn't. Right. So it tipped and then it dropped. Exactly. I remember as well, it wasn't fun, was it? It was not. You could not give those houses away. And I had construction loans out on all those houses at the time at nine and three quarter percent interest, which was good mm -hmm. at the time. Everybody's, everybody's worried about 5% interest right now. Right. Back then, when you were doing construction loans, nine and three quarters was good on those houses. Uh, and you had it all factored into the cost, interest reserves, right? So uh, long story short, you know, I had to work out all those properties with the banks. I mean, good thing was I had uh, really good income coming in. I mean, these things were doing a hundred to 150,000 a year in rental income. So I had income to support them and, you know, we, we worked through it and got through it, but you know, all the equity was gone. So, you know, one day I thought I could sell these houses and make three, four, 500,000, which I was doing prior to 2009. Uh, and the next day you could not give them away. I mean, it was just incredible. So you went from doing really easy, like printing money almost to all of a sudden hitting a roadblock and you had to work through that. You had, I guess you had to come to terms with um, a difficult time like so many investors uh, did, including myself. So you went all the way through the downturn like I did as well. There aren't a lot of people that survived the downturn, Greg, is what I'm getting to. Yeah. You and I both survived. We're survivors. We should get a, a shirt, right? <laughs> exactly. But it was difficult. There were a lot of obstacles along the way. And, you know, people would hear your story sometimes and they'd be like, man, it was just so easy. He could just like create cash flow and create equity so easily. Now all of a sudden that sort of turned really quickly. So how did you go from the easy life to the hard life? How did you make it through that, that difficult time? Well, uh, you know, I had to evolve and I had to change the business model. So, you know, yeah. down the outer banks, the interesting thing that happened, like you said, was not only was that easy money, you know, situation over, cause it really was easy. I mean, a lot right. of people were doing it, wasn't the only one. Um, and people were doing different things. Uh, when that happened, everybody who was a builder was instantly out of work in 2009 because all these properties were going into default. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Um, nobody was spending any money on any property. So if, if you wanted to do remodeling work or painting or even handyman work, it just wasn't uh -huh. there. So everybody was out of business and a lot of people ended up leaving. A couple of guys, you know, committed suicide that were in really deep. Um, yeah, it was just really a bad, bad time. A lot of people lost everything they had. 
uh, I was very fortunate. I had cash flow on these properties. Um, you know, they were non-recourse uh, done in the name of, you know, corporate name. So I didn't have any personal guarantees out on them. Uh, it was all corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I still, that's the only way I do deals now. I do not personally guarantee anything. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I had some advantages there that a lot of other people didn't. And then what I started doing once I worked through everything was I started looking at a new business model and I started building little uh, beach boxes, three bedroom, two bath, 1200 square foot beach boxes that cost about $125,000 to build, which, you know, the kitchens in the houses I was building before <laughs> were more, more than that, right? So uh, I started building these little beach boxes and I started, you know, hiring other builders uh, to build for me and I was building and selling those and it was just a price point thing and that segment of the market still did pretty well. So even in 2009, people were still coming down to the beach. They still did their, took their vacations. I think we saw maybe a 10% dip in the rental market. You know, the values fell off a cliff, but people still came, they rented and they still took their vacation. And there was still a, a market for an affordable house down there, which at the time there was two models uh, in between the highways close to the ocean. I would build that house. I would find a lot, build the house and I could sell it for, you know, 375 to 395 you know, cause the lots were around 125 to 150 on the other side of the highway called the West side, which is most of the year round uh, housing. You could get lots for 60 to 80,000, build that $125,000 house and you could sell it for 275 to 295. So I started doing that and that was all in finding the land and I had cash. So uh, I had a little advantage where I could just go in and close quick on the land and, and build those houses. And so were those spec houses also then? Yeah, those were all spec yeah. houses. Just so, more affordable uh, so people could still buy them. Exactly. Just tips yeah. on building spec houses because it is, it is different um, than flipping and, and other stuff. Much different. It's, you, you have know, to it's, summarize like three things that are important when building a spec house. What would they be? Well, the first thing is, um, so the question was, if there's three things that are very important in spec houses, what would they be? Okay. So number one, understand that uh, in this time, in this day and age, as busy as everybody is, and with the cost going up uh, exponentially like they are, Boy, they are. you gotta consider, consider is time frame. So it takes six to nine months for any kind of a spec house, smaller ones, to get in and get out. From the time you identify your land, um, get your plan together, take it down, get your permits, uh, get the thing built on the market and sold, that's gonna be six to nine months, pretty much anywhere you go. If you do a bigger house, it can be closer to a year. So the first thing you got to consider is that time frame and market conditions, you know, because you don't want to get caught with the market changing, interest rates going up, really affects the value. It's happening right now. It is. A lot of builders are stuck, you know, the regional and national builders, especially in Texas and Florida, some of these other areas, Arizona, you know, right now they're, they're having a hard time getting rid of inventory. So uh, when the rates go up, the value of what you can sell goes down. So you really got to watch that. The That's second thing is don't try to set a new market. In other words, just like flipping, if you're going to build a spec house and, and I do infill. So I go into, um, you know, existing okay. neighborhoods, developed yeah. neighborhoods and I buy lots or I tear a house down that creates a couple lots and I build what's around me, but I just do it to what the, the new buyers today want, which is open floor plans, you know, nice amenities, things like that. But what I don't do, as I don't try to go in like you could do pre 2009 and back pre 2004 and set a record in the market. You're not going to do that anymore. Um, what you need to do is you need to go in, identify what is the max price point I can sell for in this market market. And you want to come in under that, uh, what all the comps are selling with nice amenities and a brand new product. That's, that's where it's at. So you don't want to be greedy and try to you know, set the world on fire and create records. You want to go in, have a brand new product that's under what all the comps are, are selling for in the area. Uh, so that's really, you know, really the second thing. And, you know, obviously the third thing is your financing. You want to make sure that you've got uh, patient capital because, uh, you know, the market's mm -hmm. changing, things are happening and you want to make sure that you've got multiple exit strategies. So when you go build a spec house, what I like about the beach is when you build a spec house down there, if it doesn't sell, you put it in the rental program and it's going to make money, you know, not just break even or cover debt service. It's going to, it's going to cash flow. Uh, most year round uh, areas, when you build a spec house in the year round market, you're not going to be able to rent it to cover the cost of, of the capital in that house. So uh, I would make sure you've got patient capital uh, to do that. And if you're doing joint ventures with somebody or, or however that works, make sure that you know, you're know you like-minded and that they're patient, they understand that it's a very difficult time to build right now. And in fact, I'm kind of getting away from spec houses right now because it is the last three I built, the cost went up on, on the same house each time. And it's, it ended up costing me about 10% more 
on the third house than it did on the first one. The so labor and materials are both going up, right? It is. And everybody's busy. You know, they're having a hard time getting- Almost a labor done. shortage. Exactly. So I'm kind of getting out of it right now and, and just kind of doing some other things. So I'm kind of shying away from the spec market, but there are still pockets where it could work really well in those hot areas where things are still selling in days. You know, a spec house will work well there, but you really got to think about time frame and, and really ask yourself, you know, will What's this it work like in six months? to nine months? Right. I think yeah. that those are three great tips. I appreciate you sharing them. So what is your 2019 going to look like? What do you think? So 2019, I'm focusing more, I'm focusing less on development. So I really am not interested in bringing anything out of the ground right now. It's getting very difficult, especially on the commercial side or development side. Anything that has to go through, uh, you know, planning and zoning and things like that, whether it's a subdivision or a mixed use building or whatever, those, those are taking a long time, almost two years in some areas to get commercial yeah. site plans. Approved. Including Richmond. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Charlottesville's the same way. Albemarle yeah. County, it's, it's very difficult. So and I'm hearing that all across the country. The regulatory environment on new development is very strict and difficult. So uh, I'm looking for existing assets that are already um, uh, occupied to a degree. I look for, you know, so I'm an opportunistic investor. I look for bad and distressed assets on commercial yeah. side. Um, and on the residential side, I still do, you know, uh, renovate and sell some houses. I still flip houses. I don't do a lot of wholesaling. Mm -hmm. um, Me neither. But, you know, I'm, I'm really looking at time frames. So what, what I'd like to do in 2019 is find more uh, commercial opportunities to either redevelop something or add value to something and then, and then sell that on the back end. I'm not really interested in holding anything right now. Uh, I think it's just too unstable out there right now. The stock market's not sure where it's going. Interest rates aren't sure where they're going. Uh, the, the stock market seems to be going down and interest rates are going up. <laughs> exactly. So we've got some interesting times ahead yeah. of us in 2019 and, uh, you know, cat. I like to be a landlord of cash. Cash is king. You don't have to evict cash. You don't have to chase it down. You know, it just sits there and it doesn't talk back, right? So, you know, uh, cash is a great thing to have. So I'm kind of focused on getting in and out, creating opportunity, finding assets that I can I can do something with, get in and out of in less than a year. And uh, you know, especially in the commercial environment, you know, in the commercial sector out there right now, it's a really interesting time in commercial real estate with the way retail is going you know, the whole big box thing, um, office buildings and people like we're doing right now, working remote from home or, right. you know, for me, I, I work out of my car. I mean, I'm remote. I'm looking at deals all day. I'm traveling around in meetings. So for the most, most part, you know, if I do something like this, I'm doing it on site in my car, right. which is cool because I can kind of turn it around and show you a project I'm working on. But uh, so yeah, that's really an opportunity. Created, uh, like a backpack uh, business for yourself, which is really awesome. And nowadays it's almost like becoming a cell phone business. Exactly. Think about how much you can do on your phone. It's amazing. So what would your ideal project look like uh, for commercial in 2019? What would you like to find? Would it be an office building, an industrial building, um, like multifamily? Probably not, guessing. But, you know, what would it look like? Something underperforming, partially occupied with some fixable problems, value adds type thing? Yeah. So from an opportunistic standpoint, straight up cash flow, if you can find, you know, a multifamily building at a good cap rate, I mean, that's like gold nowadays. Everybody wants do. multifamily. Yeah. Um, and I like the bigger ones, you know, 30 units plus or minus is probably the smallest, you know, right. that I would like to do anything with. And then, and that's because of property management. It really doesn't make any sense to hire a manager unless you've got at least 30 units or more. Some people will probably tell you you need more than that, but it still works with 30 units. Um, you know, up to that hundred, 50 to 200 unit range, anything over 200 and the big boys are chasing that and you're not going to get anything no matter what the condition is, you know, for a decent cap rate. Um, but we might see that change with the cost of capital going up. I think a lot of these uh, cap rate deals we've seen in the last three or four years have been traded on basically free money. And with mm -hmm. rates going up, you can't do that anymore. So I think we're going to see cap rates go up and uh, we're going to have a chance to buy some things here in the next year. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm after in multifamily. If it's, you know, you know, something distressed, something that's convertible. So uh, like a flat top hotel, um, there's an interesting model out there where you can buy a hotel and turn that into studio apartments. Um, so that's kind of a neat model. It's an easy thing to do. Doesn't require a whole lot of zoning. You can get that approved in six months or so. Um, I'd love to find some buildings in Richmond that I convert to mixed use or, or multifamily you know, in the museum district around that area, you know, the Scott's edition areas, mm -hmm. you know, 
uh, somewhere where there's, there's still some gentrification going on. You know, Churchill would probably be a great area on the outskirts of that on the commercial side. Uh, as those areas are getting redeveloped, nobody's really doing a lot of the commercial around it. So I think at some point, you know, there may be some opportunities. I'm really looking at Richmond for some commercial redevelopment opportunities. Um, so from an industrial building standpoint, and then flex space, you know, there's a really, uh, really uh, niche need for uh, commercial industrial flex space, smaller spaces, 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, office warehouse kind of thing for the small contractors uh, to own. You can find plenty of stuff to rent, but there's nothing for anybody to buy. Uh, so that's kind of a neat little niche too, condo out an industrial building and uh, uh, sell those spaces off to some operators. Like well, very good. I need to respect your time here. We've been on for a while, but you know, I really have enjoyed the discussion on building really big beach houses, spec houses, commercial opportunities, and digging into development. And your website, Greg, is gregdickerson.com. That's it, gregdickerson.com. Email greg at gregdickerson.com. And, uh, you know, uh, my other information's on there. Feel free to reach out, you know, anytime if you have any questions or if I can help with anything or if you have any opportunities. I'm always looking for, for deals. Yeah, we, we do need to hook up. And it's gregdickerson.com or email Greg and check it out because he's got a, a wealth of information. And your Facebook page where we can see the pylons going in is just Greg Dickerson? Yeah, Greg Dickerson. Um, I've got a uh, uh, Dickerson Investments, but it's, um, it's Greg Dickerson. And that's where I've got some videos of some of the projects I've been working on. Uh, so it should be pretty easy to find. Hey, I've really enjoyed this. We covered about 25 years of your life. <laughs> In about an hour. That's pretty sad. The ups and downs, you know, yeah. of investing and what the challenges are, how you went around obstacles is amazing. And your timing was good. So congratulations on all that you've, you've done. You've done a lot. So you awesome. Well, thank you, Jim. And, and you have as well. And, you know, I really admire what you're doing and, and helping, you know, coach, train, teach people and inspire people you know, to keep going because, you know, we have some, we have some turbulent times ahead. That's so, why, uh, yeah, I agree. And, and investors, I mean, I was thinking about it the other day when I went to college for electrical engineering, I didn't, I didn't take a class called failing 101. Yeah. <laughs> you got to live that one. Down, you know, and no gurus. I mean, nobody ever talks about that. That's why I wanted to ask you that, that tough question because the way you go around obstacles and pick yourself back up in your mindset and keep going is, is really critical. So I appreciate it is. It you is. sharing that. I've, I've had my share of obstacles as well, Greg, but you got to get up, got to keep moving. You got to go over them, around them, or just take a hammer and pound through them. Exactly. Um, and then life gets better again when you're on the other side. So I appreciated your sharing that. Absolutely. Well, I enjoyed being here. Thank you, Jim. And uh, I owe you a lunch. Yeah, we do. All right, Greg, thanks again for being my guest today. I've really enjoyed this interview and wish you a world of success in 2019. Yep. Same to you.